and, and essentially I want to start with um, with a statement and see if we can build on on this statement. So here's my sort of my thesis, if you like, my um, my perspective, my idea. Uh, and that, I'll let you read that. OK, so I don't know if you if you agree with that. I think it's my experience is certainly backed up by this and also kind of just thinking about it, really, the fact that we've got lots of students with centre assessed grades, tutor assessed grades, GCSE results that represent what they would have got had they learned the material, even though they may or may not have learned the material and so on. So my suggestion or my thesis that everything that I'm going to say is built on is that because of the pandemic, um, our students have more inconsistent levels of prior knowledge than ever before. Now, in FE, our students come to us with inconsistent levels of prior knowledge because they come from all over the place, don't they? They come from all sorts of different schools that teach different subjects and they're, they're, they may be coming to do a subject they've never done before. They may be coming to do a subject they've got a level two in already or you know, there's all sorts of reasons why students come to us and there's all sorts of reasons why they might have missing understanding in the background and might have inconsistent prior knowledge. Um, and I think that the fact that we've been through the, the last two years in the way that we have uh, with centre assessed grades and so on, I think that basically means that um, their current levels or their levels of, of knowledge that they come in with are going to be more inconsistent than ever, ever before. So off the back of that, I'm going to suggest three things. Uh, we're going to talk about three things. First off is this, is this sort of theory stuff, which hopefully you'll find interesting. Um, um, and basically, why are gaps a problem? What's the big deal? So, OK, they come in with more inconsistent levels of prior knowledge, but what is the impact uh, of that prior knowledge? Why is it important that we know about it and do something about it? So why are the gaps are a problem? How can we actually diagnose the gaps? So how, how do we find out what it is they do and don't know? Um, and again, some of this will be second nature to you. Um, but I think it's just important to put these things together a little bit. And then what other things perhaps can we do to plug those gaps? What other things can we work on to make sure that those inconsistent levels of prior knowledge uh, don't lead to problems further down the line in terms of our students' skills and understanding? So we're going to look at why are gaps a problem, how can we diagnose the gaps, and what can we do uh, to plug some of those gaps? So those are our three sort of main headings as we work our way through, and you'll see across the top that's uh, a little map of where we're going, basically. So let's start off by talking about the, the problem of gaps, the problem of gaps. Now, I want to suggest to you um, that gaps are a problem uh, because they lead to something called or something known as cumulative disfluency. Now, you may have come across that concept or that term before. Um, you will certainly have come across the idea, even though maybe you may not have heard it called this before. It's actually a really straightforward idea. Um, it just has a bit of a clunky, a clunky name. So gaps are a problem because they lead to something known as cumulative disfluency. And this idea of cumulative disfluency, which I'll break down into its parts in just a moment and talk you through. Um, this idea um, has been researched a great deal and there are plenty of people writing about it. Um, and a couple of those writers say this about cumulative disfluency. So the first writer is, is Carl Binder, who is kind of the, um, the granddaddy of this idea, if you like. Um, and he said he thinks that cumulative disfluency is the most important factor in long term student failure. The most important factor in long term student failure, which is a pretty big claim, pretty bold claim. Um, and also Gallagher et al. and all the references that are at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, Gallagher et al. say this, that cumulative disfluency may be the antecedent of academic underachievement. So we're making pretty bold claims here about cumulative disfluency. So if cumulative disfluency um, is such a major issue, and we know that gaps lead to cumulative disfluency when then we need to do something about the gaps. OK, so let's let's break this down even further. What do we mean? So this is this is an uncontroversial idea. I think the fact that skills and knowledge builds that we build on our skills and knowledge, the, the component parts build towards being put together in a compound way. Let me give you a simple example, riding a bike. So if you're riding a bike, you need to learn all sorts of different bits of riding a bike. You need to know, for example, how to steer the handlebars and you also need to know how to pedal. And those are separate individual things. Your hands move the handlebars, your feet move the pedals. Those two things can be broken down as being two separate skills, two component skills. And you have to 
compound them. You have to put them together in order to be able to ride a bike. So what we're saying is that this is true of anything that we learn, anything that we um, try to pick up, any progress we want to make through the curriculum, any uh, movement from level one to level two to level three requires us to take component skills and put them together to make them more complex and for them to become compound skills. So we want to go from component to compound. So let's say here's, a, here's the diagram, diagram representation here. Um, I like my use of diagrams, as you'll see. But here's a representation. The two uh, rectangles represent the two parts that we just mentioned. They could be the two parts of any compound skill. But let's say it's being able to steer your handlebars and being able to pedal the pedals. OK, so if um, a person, whoever it might be, is learning to ride a bike and they cannot um, pedal and they cannot steer, then putting those two things together, um, they are what we refer to as dis. So they can't do it. They can't ride the bike because they can't steer and they can't pedal. So obviously they can't ride a bike. So we would say that as far as their bike riding is concerned, it's disfluent. They can't do it. OK, so what the point we're making is that the component skills are essential to move on to compound skills. And in our in our teaching and learning, the basic bits, the jigsaw pieces have to be in place if you're going to see what the whole jigsaw represents. The 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 component elements have to be there otherwise when you try and put them together there's disfluency there's confusion there's inability there's giving up and so on but what if let's say you, you, know, you obviously know the answer to this if you're riding a bike and you're really good at pedaling but you still can't steer that's represented by this so let's say that the the, the shaded in blue uh, rectangle is is because that skill has been learned the, the skill of pedaling has been learned but the skill of handlebar management or whatever you want to call it has still not been learned so can that person ride a bike well no they're still disfluent in the compound skill so the point is very simply this in order to be fluent in a compound skill you must be fluent in all of the component skills so here again on the diagram let's say handlebars pedaling Yes, this person can do both, so now they can ride a bike because those are the two, the two component skills of riding a bike. And obviously, in reality, it's way more complex than this. There's loads more components and so on, but you get the general idea. We need to have the components in place. They need to be secure before you try and put them together to move on to learn a compound skill that relies on those components. So that's, that's for a single skill. That's for a single piece of knowledge, a single under piece of understanding or whatever it might be and we can we're going to go a bit deeper into the theory here before we kind of emerge and start applying it to our our own teaching so to take you a little bit deeper then here's an example let's say this is a curriculum okay and here are all the skills that you're required to learn let's say i don't know at a level one or it might be even be before that okay and and the boxes represent skills and components that have been learned well so the, the dark blue or the blue ones, the ones that are shaded in, that, that student knows how to do that. They understand or they can do it. It's, it's a skill that they've mastered. Fabulous. They're fluent in those ones with, that, are, that are filled in with blue. The ones that are not filled in are those things that they can't do. Okay? So it might be that they can't pedal or they can't steer or they can't, um, in other subjects, they can't, uh, they don't know their times tables or they know their seven times table, but not their eight times table. They know how to multiply, but they can't multiply fractions, those sorts of things. So there are things that they can do and things that they can't do. And the issue becomes as we're trying to lead our students through a curriculum that is teaching them something new, that is potentially more complex than stuff they've learned previously, as that subject becomes more complex, more difficult, more, more components have to be fit together to make this compound understanding, we're introducing more and more gaps. So let's say, for example, building on what we just talked about, let's say if we look at this um, box on the left hand side, we've got a blue box, then we've got a, a white box and then a blue box. If we're going to build on top, if we're going to move on to the next thing, the next piece of understanding, whatever it might be, we're going to build on top of it we're building on something that is disfluent and by necessity the compound skill will also be disfluent to put more simply if we're relying on something they can't do very well in order to move on to something new that new thing they still can't do very well 
But the problem is it compounds, it increases. And as the subject gets more complex, as shown in this diagram, you'll notice that those white boxes, because more and more things, more and more links, more and more um, compound elements rely on further component elements, they get more and more confused. There's fewer and fewer success stories, you know, the fewer things that they can do, fewer skills that they pick up because they're disfluent in the components. And this is the absolute key to understanding what we mean by cumulative disfluency because you can see it accumulates these white boxes accumulate over time you know on that bottom line we've only got sort of two and a half gaps really but those gaps accumulate to the point where we get to the top of the pyramid at least what's on the screen and it's only a diagram but we get things like this and you'll have you'll have heard students say these sorts of things I've no doubt I give up and I can't do it I don't get it that's the, that's the usual one I hear that quite a lot I don't get it I'm stressing, this, this is long, and the students come up with reasons why they can't do their work and, and so on. And maybe, and it's not always the case, but maybe it's the case that they are just struggling with the components. And we're asking them in our classrooms to do some compound work, put two ideas together, and they're just not fluent enough in those basic ideas to be able to do what we're asking them to do. Now, you hopefully can see where I'm going with this. I've said right at the start that our students are coming in with more gaps than ever before. So just by a glance at the diagram, introducing more gaps means more and more disfluency. As, as if we just ignore those gaps and we just carry on regardless and work our way through the curriculum, those gaps are going to expand. They're going to become more profound. And we're going to hit this point of I give up or I can't do it or I don't get it. We're going to hit that point even earlier than ever before. And so we need to be really careful about identifying, um, diagnosing the gaps and working out what we can do about them. So just to just to build slightly more before we pause for a second, this is where we get to um, if we've got gaps in our prior understanding. Um, and some of the research that I've read around this will indicate that one of the problems is that teachers are often, um, and we're all in the same boat, teachers are often find it difficult to identify where the gaps are and difficult to know what to do about it. So this quotation is from McDowell, Keenan and Kerr a few years back now, um, talking about the tasks that students weren't able to do even though they'd moved on to something else. They say this, these tasks were no longer under instruction. They might be pedalling or steering. And that indicates their teachers may have been unaware of the extent to which the participants were still experiencing difficulty performing these basic skills. But they go on and they say this as well. More worrying still is that even if they were aware of these difficulties, teachers may have felt unable to do anything to remediate these problems. So not only... In, in McDowell, Keenan and Kerr's experience, teachers weren't fully aware of the difficulty students were having with some of those gaps. Even if they did know, those teachers may not have known what to do about it. And so that's what we're going to think about in just a second. Um, again, from, from the research though, just, just finally before we do move on, the research suggests there are several things that students will do. And I don't know if you recognise any of these things that students will do or consequences of cumulative disfluency, of getting to the point where the gaps become overwhelming. There's, there's too many gaps in their prior knowledge, they just can't access it anymore. And we get things like this, coping strategies in place of learning. So, you know, head on the desk, miss going to go to the toilet, all that sort of stuff, just, just trying to wheedle out of having to do any learning because it's just not doable because they don't get it. Uh, snowballing deficiencies, apparently, getting worse as the time goes by might make and i guess this is this is student dependent of course but some students potentially then fall into a bit of rebellious behavior it can happen um certainly this is probably the most common one um i don't know if you remember if you if you have learned to drive if you remember the process it's really stressful and the, your brain hurts and you somehow you can't get your hands and your feet to all work together and so on it's really stressful um and sometimes you might even, you know, think, I remember just calling up and thinking, I can't do it today. I'm, I'm cancel my lesson today because I don't fancy the stress of it. This sense of being overloaded and maybe even a lack of attention span. And so those are the sorts of things we would expect to see in a cohort of students where they've got lots of gaps and they've already been moved on. So what can we do in terms of 
finding out where the gaps are. Well, unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. There's, there's no way of looking inside the student's brain and identifying where the gaps are and giving them those bits of info that can just solve it instantly. Just not possible. Um, but what one thing that, and we'll start with the negative and move on to the positives. What, one of the problems is that in previous years, obviously we've used um, grades that students come in with as a, a pretty solid indicator of their kind of existing knowledge. It's not perfect, but it's been pretty good. Um, my concern is, and the thesis of this kind of chat, is that that is now more unreliable than ever. The grades that our students are getting or coming in with, their certificates and so on, their, their, their grade fours and grade, grade fives are more unreliable than ever before. Um, they may have been unreliable in the past, but even more so now, because some of the students will have come from schools where maybe the teachers push the tag grades up a little bit and some some not so much. And then it, it's just a bit of a jumble. And so we can't re, re, we can't rely too much on the CAGs and the tags as our starting point. We need some other things to determine where these gaps are that the students um, are experiencing. So I'm going to say that, the, that those those GCSE grades are not as useful as, as they might have been previously. So what can we rely on? So to some extent, I think we can rely on teacher expertise. And this is I think this is a really important point that we need to we need to accredit our own hunches a little bit. We need to give credit to our professional perspective. You will know your subject uh, better than anybody else because you, you've been teaching it for however long you've been teaching. If you're new to it, then obviously you, that will build over time. That, that's great. So your, your teacher expertise will, will tell you what are the most likely things that students don't know. So if you think back about students, you know, having been taught in lockdowns and so on, what are the things that perhaps in coming into your classroom, they might not have grasped all that well because perhaps they didn't have access to the teacher or the, you know, the whole process of learning from home was difficult for them. What are your educated hunches about what students do and don't know? So I teach sport, for example, and one of the things that students regularly get wrong, I know, is that they mix up the work of the respiratory system with the work of the cardiovascular system. And they get confused about which bit which bit is got has got air flowing through it and which bit has got blood flowing through it. And they get all that confused. And I know that because I've taught it a bunch of times and it's the same sort of stuff that comes up and again and again. So having that kind of understanding about your subject enables you to kind of in advance have a have a decent hunch as to what things are most likely to be the gaps in your students' understanding. So that's really important. PCK is another term for teacher expertise, basically. PCK is pedagogical content knowledge. And it, it really means knowing your subject the way a teacher knows their subject. What, what are the pitfalls? What are the misconceptions? What to teach first? What to teach next? And that sort of stuff. So teacher expertise, don't underestimate it. Don't underestimate it, your own ability to know what's likely to be missing in your students' understanding. And then some other things, and there's lots of other things we could talk about here. Questioning. Um, you may have come across Rose and Shine's principles before, and one of the principles for effective instruction in there is to ask loads of questions. And I think that's especially important that we ask lots, especially at the front end of a lesson. Uh, and in particular, when we're introducing something new, we should really spend a lot of time probing um, the areas of prior knowledge that our students may or may not have. Because it might be that you start asking some questions about the thing you're going to teach that day and realise, wow, they, they really don't know anything about this. I need to I need to I need to go back even further and start even earlier in, in the knowledge sequence. So I'm going to have to go back and think think it through even more carefully. So questioning is going to be super important. And again, Rosenshaw's principles suggest that an effective teacher spends a very large proportion of the lesson questioning students because questioning is a form of assessment for learning, of course. And then there's quizzing as well. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of quizzing. Um, there's loads of kind of IT um, tools, tech tools that you can use for quizzing. You know, there's Kahoot and quizzes and clickers and all sorts of stuff and what's really great about them is you get in the moment data information um, from your quizzes that you can quickly look at and say okay yeah great we've got that we can move on or it looks like there's a significant chunk of the class that don't understand this concept let's do it again let's go over it again let's try again let me explain it again let's do another task let's whatever it might be so quizzing is super useful and i'd really recommend lots and lots of quizzing 
Um, but always low stakes quizzes. Don't stress your students out with too many. Don't don't tell them it's a test or anything like that. It's just quizzes. It can be as fun as you like. Um, it can be, um, you know, all sorts of fun stuff you can do to make quizzes interesting. That That's all great. That's fine. The, what we're after really is to know what the students know. It doesn't have to be super intense pen and paper, everybody in silence necessarily, unless that's the way you want to run it and that's up to you because you're the teacher. OK, so that's so those are some of the ways we can diagnose the gaps. Um, and so what do we do then if we if we've spotted some gaps, what can we what can can we do about it? OK, so um, again, building on what we've just talked about. Um, we can anticipate those misconceptions and I really do. Again, I want to emphasize your role as an expert in your classroom. Your subject expertise is absolutely invaluable. You know from having taught your subjects and having learned about your subjects and uh, having qualifications in your subject, you, you know what the tough stuff is. You know what the easy stuff is, you know what's in between, you know what stuff comes first and you should teach this first and then this next. Absolutely rely on that uh, professional um, deep understanding to anticipate what you think your students probably don't know. I think that's really important and, and I don't want to underestimate that in any way. Those are your best bets, I think, as to your student gaps. But also if you're and again, if you're new to the new to the teaching game or you've picked up a new subject or a new unit or a new module, talk to people about what they found. Th their students got this wrong last time. Why do you think they get that wrong? What did you do to solve that problem? And so on. That that peer expertise is also really valuable too. So make use of the peers that are around you that teach your subject. And again, that doesn't necessarily have to be in in house. That can be on social media networks and so on. Um, secondly, make sure you're doing loads of review, retrieval and revisiting. So I would suggest um, and again, it's your classroom. Um, you, you make the call, but I would suggest no new topic should ever be introduced without activating its prior or prerequisite content. OK, so prerequisite means they need to know this before they can do this. They need to know this before they can know that, whatever it might be. This, these are those components and compounds that we're talking about. So don't introduce a compound idea without reactivating or, or revisiting or retrieving the component ideas that it is built from. OK, and then teach the next bit, add the next bit onto their existing understanding. And one great way of doing that um, to make sure you're revisiting all the time is to teach the same content, but do it in different formats. There's, I don't think there are any hard and fast rules or anything like that in the in the science or in the uh, cognitive data that suggests one particular number of times that you should do it. But I've seen, you know, um, people saying things like for, to have any meaningful recall, you probably need to revisit a, a topic meaningfully three or maybe four times before you can consider that that topic to have really been learned. So that's important. That's important to take on board. We don't just introduce something once and then move on to something else. We've got to review, retrieve and revisit. And the other thing, and this is really tricky. Um, and this depends on your context, it depends on your subject. It depends on where we are in the year. Obviously, now um, if you've got some new starters in January, it'll be different. But as much as possible, I would recommend that you go slowly. Go, go or go as slowly as you can. Um, and, and really what I'm saying is split into as smaller chunks as possible your teaching. So teach as little new information as you can get away with each lesson. Now, obviously, you've got a curriculum to cover. You can't just ignore that. There's the stuff you've got to get through. I, I appreciate that. But as much as possible, cover as little as possible in each new session rather than racing through stuff, because essentially what we're doing is as we race through stuff, we are risking introducing gaps. And the other thing is this idea that learning is generative. That is, novices learn really slowly, but experts learn faster. So therefore, it's OK to spend more time with the novices getting the novice stuff sorted because the speed of learning will pick up. So don't assume that your, your students have a set speed of learning. They will learn faster the more they understand the, com the component parts. That seems almost counterintuitive, doesn't it? The more time you spend on doing the basic stuff and getting the, the components right, the quicker they will learn the compound stuff. The quicker they will pick up the stuff that has to be put together. 
So what we're trying to do really is in the component stuff, we're aiming for fluency. We're aiming for their knowledge to be snappy. There's another way of thinking about it. You ask them a question and you get the answer nice and quick because it's snappy. It's really well learned. It's well embedded. So those I would say are the three things. And I'm going to I'm going to in a minute, I'm going to stop and I'm going to give you some uh, questions to consider and perhaps we'll consider them in the chat as well. Um, those I think are three really key things that we can do to be making sure that we're we're plugging the gaps and remember anticipate misconceptions review retrieve and revisit and go as slowly as you can obviously um, with the caveat that obviously you've got stuff to cover and this is really interesting so before i do put that on the screen let me just introduce this idea so carl binder is the chap who came up with the concept of cumulative disfluency essentially um, and his argument is that if we are successful enough in our teaching, when our learners learn the component parts well enough, that has two effects. One effect is um, that it, sometimes our students will hit uh, like a, an OIC or a Eureka moment, a light bulb moment. Suddenly it will make sense. So he argues that. And he also argues that if we do spend time on those component parts, we actually enable ourselves to speed up later on, which is why we've got this snail on the screen here, this goes slowly. His argument is that getting the basics really, really well learned, fluent, then the later concepts can be learned more quickly. So this is what he says. I'll let you just have a moment to read it. So I think this is this is super important and super interesting. So this is this is the guy that came up with the idea of cumulative disfluency. And, and this is the guy talking to us about what to do in terms of or how how filling the gaps works. And he's saying, number one, um, if you work on the components and get the components fluent, then sometimes when you move on to the larger chunks of behavior, or he, that's how he phrases it, I'm phrasing as the, the compound that whatever, you know, the riding the bike part, sometimes they would emerge without any explicit training. It would be a eureka moment. And, and we, you know, we have this kind of folk understanding of, you know, suddenly the, the inspiration will strike. But that isn't really how understanding works. Inspiration strikes, you know, it's that old, old adage, it's 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration. That's how, that's how learning works. We, we work hard at the components, and then it may be that suddenly we have this moment, this lightning strikes moment where everything fits together and makes sense. But that is more likely. We can make that more likely by really focusing in on the on the components. And then the other thing that he says in this last section here, at a minimum, at least we can come back to those composite or compound behaviors or skills or learning or whatever, the larger chunks. And it would be easier to teach them because the components were no longer holding them down slowing them down, holding them back. So it's a really, I think it's a really um, important argument um, about how we go about teaching to make sure that our students' gaps are filled and don't become cumulative over time. So to finish up then, or to, to pass over to you folks, um, I want you to just have a little bit of a think about that. I'm going to put three things to think about on the board, or on the, well, not on the board, I'm still in teaching mode, on the screen. Um, think of a unit or a module that you teach. OK, so it could be one that you've just picked up. It could be one you're about to about to start in January, something like that. Um, and see if you can consider these questions. Now, uh, take each of these however you like. But first off, so to go to anticipating misconceptions, what do you think are the most likely or most common misconceptions for that unit? OK, so think about your unit. So for me, for anatomy and physiology, again, most common misconceptions usually around confusing the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system. Students do it all the time. So how do I solve that problem? What explanations do I use? What examples do I use? What analogies do I find useful? How do I go about doing that? So you'll probably already have, because you're a consummate professional, you'll probably already have some ideas about how to solve some of those problems. How to talk to your students and explain to your students the content and the concepts that solve the problem of misconceptions. 
So that's one thing to think about. Secondly, on the review, retrieve and revisit, what strategies, I know, you know, I'm sure that we're all using these sorts of things, but maybe it'd be good to share because people do things in, in different ways. What strategies would you use or could you use to activate prior knowledge to get students thinking about stuff they previously learned that they're going to now need to rely on in today's lesson? And what other things might you be able to try? And then this one, again, probably the trickiest one. Do you think you could slow your teaching down? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm a realist, there's stacks and stacks of constraints. It might be that the answer to that question is no, in which case I'm happy with that, that's fine. But if it's possible, could you? Could you slow your teaching down? And the other, the other thing that's relevant here is how do you decide when to move on to the next thing? How do you know if they've got it? Not just that they've got it, but they've got it well enough to build something on top. How do you decide when is time to move on? This is a... Uh, this is how one uh, one blogger uh, who's a uh, former head teacher, a successful head teacher, now an author and a education consultant. Uh, it's fairly well known on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, a chap called Tom Sherrington uh, blogged this last year. Um, what do you do with these gaps? Basically, this is answering this question. You deal with it head on, he says. You teach them what they don't know at every stage, even if it means going very, very slowly and going back as far as you need and going over it again and again. So again, you know, we've got all these constraints, haven't we, of how much we need to cover and we've got these constraints. If we've got a really wide range of existing knowledge and um, we've got some who've got no idea what you're talking about and some have done it to death and can, are ready to do something else, how we solve that problem uh, is definitely a conversation I think that's worth having. Um, so finally, uh, these are, this was our thesis at the start. Given the pandemic, our students have more inconsistent levels of prior knowledge than ever before. And we sought to answer three questions. Why are gaps a problem? And I suggest it's because of the impact of cumulative disfluency. So we had all those pictures at the start, those little diagrams, um, that the gaps basically become more and more, uh, they accumulate over time and our students become less and less fluent as a result. Um, how can we diagnose the gaps? Well, I've suggested PCK, that pedagogical content knowledge, that kind of teacher expertise, using lots and lots of questions and questioning uh, and then quizzes as well. What can we do to the plug the gaps? And again, this is where we've had our discussion and there's some of these things that you might think, well, I'm not so sure about that. And again, that's absolutely fine. I'm not here to tell you how to teach. Um, what can we do to plug the gaps? We can anticipate where the gaps might be and you can rely on your understanding for that, um, your professional knowledge of your subject. Lots and lots of review, go over stuff again and again and again. And also, if it's possible, I would recommend slowing down. So on the, on the point of slowing down and what do you do with those students who are ready to move on, um, Perhaps move them deeper rather than moving them on is, is a way to think about it. So rather than moving to a new topic, can they go deeper in the current topic that they're on? And again, uh, that will make sense to you more or less depending on how you fit that into your, your own subject. I don't know what each of you teaches. Um, so that'll look different for each of us.